All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you? It's great to be with you. Uh, those of you in this room, if you're joining us online from anywhere in the world, thanks for being a part of this. Um, I want to start with this, and Gary mentioned this before, but if you're just now kind of dialing in, last uh, weekend at our Easter services, 27 people stood up and said yes to Jesus. 27 people. Incredible. So, if that was you, or if that has been you any time in the last year or whatever, and you've never done this, uh, we want to know that you said yes to Jesus. So you can text Z yes to 77411 or go to the website and you can hit the yes button there and say, that was me. Now what? And we will come alongside you, help with you with some of your next steps in following Jesus. So uh, thanks for making that decision. And God's going to do something incredible in your life. Uh, I want to start out today by doing a little wordplay, a little game, and this is going to require some participation from you. So I'm going to put a word up on the screen, and then I want you to shout out the very first word that comes to your mind. Okay, are you ready? Say yes. Okay, all right. Here we go. Tree. Leaf. Okay. Car. Drive. Girl. Boy. Xylophone. No, not, 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 re not really. You, hopefully you don't have one for that. Uh, here's the last one. Sky. Blue. So th we all know that when you hear certain words, there are certain images, there are certain emotions, or other words that kind of, that, that are evoked out of that word. Uh, I'm going to give you one more word. I don't want you to tell me what you think about it, but just look at it. Christian. Christian. See, because what happens when we maybe in church see that, that's one thing. But a number of years ago, there was some research done, and a bunch of 16 to 29-year-old outsiders of faith were asked the question, hey, when you hear the word Christian, what comes to mind? Here's what they said. They said, well, hypocritical, too political, too focused on getting converts, anti-homosexual, sheltered, and judgmental. That's what we think when we hear that word. So this is why we're, we're doing this series right now, My Issue with Christians, uh, six negative perceptions about Christianity and what to do about it. Because this is our reality, and you can say, well, well that's not me, and I already know coming into this conversation, this doesn't apply to any of you. So we'll just get that out of the way. This is for other people, but it might be helpful if we all chose to kind of lean in and listen a little bit, and we might actually get something out of it. Uh, so, so we're doing this series because there's all these issues. And unless you've been living in a cave, uh, you know that uh, modern-day Christianity has an image problem. And we're not doing this series because of image management. That's not the issue. That's not what we're trying to do. Uh, but what we are trying to do is to address some of the negative perceptions that are there and sometimes rightly and accurately there about those of us who name the name of Christ and what we can actually do about it. Now, the answer is it to present kind of a faux Jesus, you know, a, a Jesus that's just a good man, a moral teacher, kind of a nice guy, blonde hair, blue eyes, holds lambs, um, nor is it to present a non-biblical Christianity that doesn't uh, uh, bring a message of hope to a broken world who is loved deeply by God but is out of harmony with God and is, is in need of reconciliation. The answer is, though, and this is the hard part for you and me, is to admit and to confess that we're part of the problem, that we have in some way contributed to some of the negative perceptions about Christians and about Christianity, and that we should be willing to engage in a conversation with ourselves and with other people that we know who are outside of faith, friends, family members, people that you work with, and go, hey, I'd like to get better at being a Christian. Can you give me some perspective on this? doesn't mean that you're going to change your, uh, your views or your opinions or your uh, theological beliefs, and it doesn't mean that they're going to change either. But it does mean that we can, in our agreement to disagree, we can treat each other with dignity and respect. So you say, how do I engage this series? How do I get the most out of it? Here's what I would say. Uh, avoid defensiveness. Don't be that person that's just like, well, that's not me and I'm not listening anymore. Uh, number two, seek to understand there are things here that you don't know yet. 
And, and if you close your mind off and, and you become the kind of person that says, well, let me teach you, let me tell you why you have an issue, then you'll, you'll never lean in and learn what God wants you to learn. Uh, number three, don't give up too early. Uh, this is week one. We're going to go through this six weeks. And so don't come to the end of this message and go, that was too hard. I'll see you in six weeks, Scott. You know, uh, and then lastly, be authentic. D just be honest about where you are, what you've done, the mistakes that you've made, uh, maybe the ma mistakes that you're making right now. And I think maybe if we all kind of commit to doing that, things could be a little bit different. Now, I'm really excited about this series, and one of the reasons I'm excited about this series because all of these six things don't apply to me. I've got it all nailed, okay? So this is really about you because I'm for you, and I want you to get better. No, uh, I'm, I'm right here with you, but I am excited about this series because it's kind of a forum, and the only thing that would make this series better would be all the outsiders that we know, the ones that you're married to, you know, the ones that are your children, the ones that are your parents, uh, the ones that you work with, the ones that you live by, if they were in the room and they could hear what we're talking about, and then you could go to lunch and they said, man, let's talk about that because I see a lot of that in you. But we're cheating because it's kind of an internal conversation. Hopefully we'll get better and it'll, it'll eek its way out into the community, into the lives of those who don't know Jesus. But for now, uh, you get to hear this without accountability of anybody on the outside saying, hey, you need to get better at that. Because we all know that we do. So I think what we want to do here is to listen to God uh, to one another, to the Word of God. We want to learn from what God is teaching us. We want to experience moments of inspiration, even some angst. We want to feel the tension. And hopefully we would experience some transformation in our personal lives that would lead to the transformation of others who do not yet know Jesus. For me, this whole thing starts with a confession. It, it starts with me saying to anybody that I've ever misrepresented Jesus to, I'm sorry. I didn't do it all right. I didn't say the right things all the time. I didn't say the right words all the time. I didn't act the right way all the time. I wasn't everything that you needed me to be so that you can clearly see Jesus in me. And I don't know if you're comfortable with this, but uh, if you are, this would be just a good practice for us to get in the habit of, and that's to say, I'm sorry. So if you will, on the count of three, one, two, three, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Those, those two words are so powerful in beginning the conversation around something new. Those two words are so powerful when you are admitting, hey, uh, I want to move towards you, and I'd like you to move toward me, but it starts with my confession and, and me admitting that I haven't got it all figured out. And I think this is where we start. So uh, we're going to look at some data. We're going to look at some stats. We're going to look at the Bible. And we're going to see where do we go from here. That's what this series is really all about. So if you have a Bible, let me invite you to go over to Matthew chapter 23. And if you have the uh, ZCC app, open that up to message notes. There's a lot of tools in there that will help you get a little bit more out of our time together today. Uh, now, when I was a kid... One of my favorite uh, holidays was Halloween because I love the candy, for one. And secondly, I love the costumes because who doesn't want to be Batman or Spider-Man or Superman for at least one night, right? Um, but what I really liked more than anything was being able to wear a mask. Because when I wore a mask, then, you know, it allowed you to do things that you typically wouldn't do or you typically wouldn't get away with because nobody knows who you are behind the mask. So if you took a little extra candy, you know, out of the, out of the bin, or if you rang a few doorbells and ran off, or if you threw some rotten eggs, as some bad kids were known to do, um, it was okay. You got away with it because nobody knew who you were because the mask concealed the real you. Now, most of us have grown up and taken off the costume, but not all of us have taken 
off the mask. We still wear it. We still wear it. Masks are ancient, been around for a long time. The ancient Greeks used to wear masks in theater. And so if you're an actor, you wore a mask. And it allowed you to kind of suspend reality so that people would, be, uh, uh, would believe more in the part that you were playing because they didn't know who you actually were. And, and the word for a person who was wearing a mask as an actor was actually the word hypocrite. Hypocrite. And originally the word hypocrite meant to play a part. But eventually, as time went on, it meant pretending to be someone that you're not. And this is one of the main issues that people outside of faith have with those of us who name the name of Jesus. They say that we are hypocritical, that we're hypocritical. You say, that's not me. I, I know, I, I already told you this isn't you. It's somebody else, it's somebody else, but just stay with me here. You say, well, what, what specifically are they saying? Well, this is the perception that is out there right now, and this data is, is actually out there from, from a big study. Go ahead. Yeah, Christians say one thing but live something entirely different. That's what they say. That's, that's what I've experienced, they say. And we're living in a world right now where image management is at an all-time high. We want to look good on the outside to others. Nobody gets up in the morning when their hair's, you know, all out here, and they got bags under their eyes and no makeup, and everything is showing, and they take a selfie and go, ready for the morning, and put it on social media. Nobody does that. Like, no, 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 no. We want to put our best selves out there. Here's, here's the danger. When that creeps into our real lives, into our spiritual lives, and then when it, it leaks into a community then that blocks people on the outside from seeing the real Jesus and accessing the truth that is found in the gospel. You say, well, well, I mean, that's not my problem, what other people think. That's really their problem. Should I even care about what other people think? I, I think we should. There was a book that was written a number of years ago called Unchristian by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. This actually uh, kind of prompted uh, this series that we're going through right now. And one of the things they say is that, let me tell you why perceptions matter. They say there's four reasons why this actually matters and why we should pay attention to it. It says, number one, what people think about Christians influence how they respond to us. And so, if you want to live in a bubble and you don't really in, want to engage anybody who's outside of your Christian bubble, then this doesn't matter. But if you, if you love people who are outside of the faith and you say, I, 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 want, to, I want to invite them in, then this matters because if they perceive you as being hypocritical and bigoted and, and hateful and all these other things, you're never going to engage a conversation. And number two, what people think about Christians should help us be objective. None of us has a clear representation of what our lives really look like from the outside. We need the perspective and the point of view of other people so we can go, whoa, that might actually be true of me. God, what do you want me to do about that? Number three, uh, what people think about Christians can change. I mean, if there was no hope of changing anything, then we could just move on. But if we invite the Spirit of God and one another to create something new within us and we become new people, a new community, then the needle can move about what people think about Christians and Christianity in a positive direction. Uh, and then lastly, what people think about Christians reflects personal stories. Th this data isn't coming out of a vacuum. People encountered people. These are stories of real people, and this is why this perception is actually out there. So what does Jesus have to say about being hypocritical? If you follow Jesus around, you know that Jesus reserved his harshest criticism for people who said one thing but did another thing, especially people who claimed to represent God, but they were actually standing in the way of people who were trying to make their way toward God. And in Jesus' day, that was the religious leaders of the day. And so on one particular day, he's teaching, and they're in the crowd that day, and so he just kind of lays it on them. Here's what he says. 
He says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those who enter who are trying to. Why does Jesus condemn hypocrisy? Because it blocks people from meeting Jesus. It blurs the message. It stalls people from seeking after God. And it creates an environment where people turn their back on God because they're first turning their back on followers of God. This is what bothers Jesus. And I think we've all at some point in our life had a little bit of I say this, but I do that kind of a mentality. We've all been guilty of that. And so an additional part of this confession that we're having would go something like this. I'm sorry for the gaps in what I say and what I do. I admit it. There have been times when I've been self-righteous. There have been times when I say this is what I believe about the Bible. This is what I believe about people. This is what I believe about money. This is what I believe about loving people. And yet I have not actually done that. And so this is our way of saying we haven't always gotten that right. Uh, the Barna Group, who's done extensive research with Americans and with Christians in America, uh, did a study on exploring a hundred different variables around values and behavior and lifestyle between Christians and non-Christians. And though Christians, they had a distinction when it came to religious stuff like going to church, owning Bibles, and uh, a good thing, actually giving more money to charity. But when it came to daily choices, daily behaviors, and daily lifestyle, what, what Barna found was there was, guess what? No difference. No difference. Well, that's not me. I, I, I know. There should be a difference, though, and there should be a difference because, you know, we're pious and we're better than people who are not Christians. In fact, this is one of the issues that's actually out there. In the book on Christian, they said, the primary reason outsiders feel hostile toward Christians, and especially conservative Christians, is not because of any specific theological perspective. What they react negatively to is our swagger how we go about things in the sense of self-importance we project. Whoa. And some of you who are not Christians and you're here and you're watching, or some of you who are new Christians, so that's exactly what kept me away from Jesus for so long. And that's why some of you are sitting right here, you're like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning in, I'm coming to church, but, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm checking it out and I'm seeing if these people are real because I've seen a lot of swagger in my experience with Christians. And we don't want to go there. There should be a difference, but the difference should emerge out of the fact that when you meet Jesus and you really come to know Him in an authentic way, you're a new person. We're a new community with a new identity. And so our lifestyle should be distinctive. No question about that. The Apostle Paul wrote about that. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Then he goes into some detail. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. There should be a distinction. There should be a difference. But is there? The people that see you most, who know you best, who are outside of faith, would they say they see in you a completely different way of life? Or would they go, you're not that different than me? Some of the data that came out of the book was that outsiders' view on difference in Christian lifestyles, 84% said, yeah, I know a Christian personally, but only 15% said, I see a lifestyle difference. Wow. Wow. When I look at that statistic, I'm like, is that me? Is, am I that person 
Have I ever been that person when people look at me like, yeah, you're a, you're a religious guy. I mean, you're paid to do it. But when it comes to just really being different than anyone else, I don't actually see it. And so when, when people outside of faith look at you and me and they see that, that kind of a, a, a distinction, they, they take that hypocritical label and they go, fits perfectly. Fits perfectly. Because you say one thing, but you do something altogether different. Now, this isn't meant to shame anybody, and this isn't meant to make anybody feel guilty or anything like that. And again, it's probably not you. Um, but you have to ask yourself the question, why the disparity? What have we done that has created this perception? And, and, and I want to I put a question up here, and I just want you to think about it. I don't want you to answer it, okay? Here it is. What's the number one priority of a follower of Jesus? Let that sit there for a second. What's the number one priority of a follower of Jesus? Okay, you got your answer? Okay. Because when most Christians are actually asked this, here's what they respond with. Avoiding sin. The number one thing that you can do as a Christian is avoiding sin. This is kind of your core identity. And when people outside of faith look at something like that, they're like, um, that's not that attractive to me, avoiding sin. I need a bigger vision if I'm going to completely change my lifestyle, if I'm going to move in this, from this direction to move in this direction, you better have a grander vision than me avoiding sin. But when they look at Christians, sometimes they say, that's what you're really all about. And that's what Christians actually say about themselves. That's like saying the number one way to have a healthy lifestyle is to not smoke. Now, that's helpful. And inhaling smoke into your lungs is probably going to shorten your, your lifespan, but that's not the number one thing that you can do to have a healthy lifestyle. We all know this. The number one thing that you can do to have a healthy lifestyle is actually eating chocolate. So I just set a bunch of you free. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I already know because somebody sent me a link after the first service. Is like, and it was a list of how dark chocolate can actually contribute to your health. So that's a gift, right? So we've gotten this idea, I think, that uh, being a Christian is more about things that we don't do than things that we do do. It's all about avoiding stuff. And somehow that message has gotten out to the people who don't know Jesus. And so this is kind of a third confession. I'm sorry for sending you the wrong message. So, somehow you got that message from me in conversations or my judgment or whatever. That it was less about a, a grander idea of being in a relationship with God and being a part of transforming the world. And it got into this little narrow thing of not doing these certain things. What's missing? What's missing? The thing that's missing when you ask most Christians what's the number one priority of a follower of Jesus is loving God, loving people, loving a broken world. That doesn't make the top of the list. Now, none of this is to say that you should not be living according to God's standard. You should. None of this is to say that you shouldn't be avoiding sin because you should. I think that the, the bigger issue is that the sins that we, tend to, uh, that we, we tend to want to avoid are these larger sins, but we don't really pay that much attention to the hidden sins in our life. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Jerry Bridges who actually wrote about this in a book he called Respectable Sins, he says, we may have become so preoccupied with some of the major sins of society around us that we have lost sight of the need to deal with our own more refined or subtle sins. It's safer to do it that way. Meaning, there are the biggies. There, there's adultery and murder and all the other sins that I don't commit. But we're not going to talk about these other things. 
And this was the major issue that Jesus had with the religious leaders. And in and, and, and Matthew 23, there's a series of woes because they were focusing on all of this outside stuff, but they were, they were neglecting the internal stuff. They were neglecting their hidden sins. And Jesus calls it out. This is kind of long, but stay with me. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be people as righteous but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe. Where do those woes fall on you and me? Where are the things that we say, okay, definitely don't do these big things, but we're not going to talk about these little things. And you notice how Jesus is is basically saying he's attacking how looking good on the outside can cover up what's on the inside. He's attacking the mask. And, and, And I have to tell you, there have always been and there always will be Christians and Christian leaders who want to define Christianity on externals only, what you see from the outside, and, and not what's on the inside, not what's on the heart. In fact, when the Apostle Paul went into an area of Galatia uh, in, in the first century, and he was spreading the gospel, and tons of people came to know Jesus, and then he left to go plant churches in other places, then a group of religious leaders came in, and they said, oh, 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 uh, faith in Jesus to become a Christian is not enough. You've got to add something to it. You've got to add physical circumcision in order to become a Christian. Now, this is not like uh, circumcise your babies, you know, uh, within the first eight days. This is like adult men. Now, you have to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. So, every Tuesday night, come on in, bite down on a towel, and we'll get it done, and then you can join the church, okay? And, you know, this is kind of out there, and Paul hears about this, and he's like, oh, no, oh, no. He writes an entire book of the Bible called the Letter to the Galatians to address this issue, and this is one of the things he says. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The externals do not matter. The only thing that counts is what? Faith expressing itself through what? Love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's what really matters. Because here's what happens. This is what Christians can do. We can get really good at sin management. You you know, we can uh, carefully construct a life that avoids these biggie sins, but still be guilty of hypocrisy because we have no love for people who we deem to be bigger sinners than ourselves. Paul says, that's a problem. Anybody a Star Trek fan? Old school, new school. You know, I, I liked the original stuff, you know, Captain Kirk. I love the next generation, but I like the new stuff with J.J. Abrams, who's done, taken over all the directing there. And in, in 2009, uh, the first Star Trek with J.J. Abrams came out, and there's this one a guy named Nero who, who wants to destroy all Vulcans, okay? And so 
he has on his ship this red matter. Has anybody seen this movie? Yeah. He's got this red matter, and this red matter can destroy things. And so he has a ship, and he drills down into the center of planet Vulcan, and then he drops this red matter down into the center of planet Vulcan, and it actually does this. It creates a black hole, and the entire planet implodes upon itself. Boom. It's gone. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul is warning about. He says, if, if you want to focus on externals, if, if you're going to start defining the core of Christianity by things that you do and do not do, especially things that have nothing to do with Christianity, if it's just about the outside stuff, you are going to be sucked into the vortex of a black hole as an individual. Your church is going to get sucked in, and anybody that you are trying to influence for Jesus who is outside of faith, they're going to get sucked into, and nobody is going to live the way that God has designed them to live, and nobody is going to come to know Jesus as a result of your influence. Don't do it. So, confronting hypocrisy, by the way, has more to do with than just addressing this gap between what we say and what we do. It's also kind of a way that we approach our lives, okay? Um, it, it, it's about this. I don't know. It's about transparency. It's about being a vulnerable person. It's about being willing to admit that you don't have it all together. And I don't know where you are on that, but we've got to get better at that. I remember when I was in seminary, and I sat in one of my professor's classes, and one of the professors said, if you're going to be a senior pastor… Uh, let me give you a bit of advice. Um, never tell people that you're broken. Never reveal your weaknesses. Never admit your sin. Never let people see who you really are. And I listened to that, and I said, if I have to be a pastor who's going to pretend to have it all together, who's going to only say things about when I am strong and never about when I'm weak. If I have to be a pastor who says, you know, I'm, I'm better than you and I'm above all of that, then I'll choose another profession. I'm not going to be that kind of a pastor. And I just chose, yeah. And, and I'll have to tell you, sometimes it gets me into trouble. Because some people want to, want to keep a leader on a pedestal and they're like, oh man, I really respected you until I found out you were normal. I, I get it. But there should be no pastors who live that way, and there should be no Christians who live that way. Because I don't want to be the kind of a leader who puts on airs, because you know what? That's going to creep into your life, and it's going to creep into this community, and we're going to become one of those churches that looks down on other people. And they're not really invited in because they could never be as good and as holy and as perfect as we are because we keep all of our sins hidden. That's not who we're going to be. And so another confession would be, hey, I'm sorry for not being real about my own shortcomings. We've all been there. We've all been there. You've been at work and there's somebody sharing with you at work, and, you know, they, they went to a party that, that uh, over the weekend, and they came in on Monday morning, like, man, we went out, we got so wasted, you know, and it was so fun, and da da da, da. and you said, well, you know, the Bible says drunkenness is a sin. <laughs> and they're like, tell me more about Jesus. <laughs> no one's going to do that. Say, I'm better than you. Instead of going, wow, you got drunk. Let me think about where I didn't honor God over the weekend before I say anything to anyone. L let me look at my own life. You see, if avoiding sin is the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, then the number one thing that you're going to do is you're going to protect your image. You're going to do everything you possibly can to put on your mask 
and to make sure that you avoid certain sins or at least you avoid the sins that anybody can see. And that's all that you will do. And the best thing, the most authentic thing that most Christians can do right now is to take off the mask. That's the most important thing. You see, this is why we're always telling you to get out of a row and into a circle. It's important for you to be in the row, to be taught, to be inspired, for you to worship God. But eventually, you got to get in a circle and you got to face other people. And you got to have some people around you that love you and that you love. And you got to be willing to say, hey, I'm Scott. I'm broken. I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes. I don't have it all figured out, but I'm just doing my best by the grace and power of God to follow Jesus with humility and passion. And then you've got to have those people say, hi, Scott, me too. Because until you are in a situation where you can do that, you're just going to become more prideful. You're you're just going to be solidified in your hiddenness, and you're just going to perpetuate the hypocritical mindset that is out there in the lives of people who are outside of faith, and they're never going to go, whoa, I'm drawn to that kind of community. But I can tell you there are people who are outside of faith who are longing, they are longing to come into a community of people who would accept them for saying, hey, you know, I was where you were. I know what it's like. I know what the brokenness is like because I still have my own. But come on in. Belong here. You'll eventually believe here. Then you can become what Jesus wants you to become, and we'll do this together. But we have to start doing it first, or no one's going to want to come in. You say, man, transparency, I've never done that. I know. A lot of people have never done that. And you only, like, want to talk to somebody else about their, you know, they're transparent. They tell you their stuff. Oh, let me help you. Let me coach you. Let me co-. No, you, you never tell your own. But let me give you some guidelines on transparency, okay? Uh, number one, only confess your sins. Are, you, are we tracking there? You know, because it's like, hey, I, I want to I um, confess, you know, my anger. But if you knew what it was like living with my wife, you, you wouldn't really be that upset that I'm an angry person, okay? Uh, Number two, only confess in a safe place. That is, don't be the person who's just like blabbing all of your stuff all over the place. Find a community of people who have the maturity and love you enough to hold your confession, to receive it, and to do something good with it. And then uh, number three, confess for the purpose of transformation, Confession isn't just so you can offload stuff and feel better about yourself. Offloading is good. That's kind of the first step of it. But ultimately, the reason that you want to, you want to confess, you want to be transparent, is because you want people to go, I got that. I'm going to be praying for you. I'm not judging you for what you just told me. And, hey, if there's anything, man, if there's, if there's anything that I can do to encourage you and help you in, in this journey, uh, man, I, I'm, I'm here for you. Super, super important. The, the early Christians used to do this all the time. James, who wrote the first book of the Bible, they believe, uh, said it this way, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. Something good can happen to you there. You can be made whole. You can be changed. You can be transformed if you're in the right community of people who love you and, and are encouraging you in that way. Confession is good. So I'm, I'm going to give you a shot at it. Um, I just want you to turn to somebody next to you. Just figure out who that's going to be. Turn to them and, and just say, I sinned this week. Just do that right now. Okay. Now, now the reality is you didn't have to tell them that. They knew. They already knew. Um, but, but, but didn't that feel good? You're like, wow. Some of you are like, I've never done that ever. Next level, same person, tell them what sin you committed. No, not not really, not really, not really. Like, 
whoa, I'm in church and I was kind of feeling it, but I didn't want to, didn't want to go all the way in. <laughs> so we've got some work to do, don't we? We've got some work to do. If I could wrap this up in one, one statement, uh, it would go something like this. If we start with transparency that leads to confession, it can result in transformation that can change the perception. Maybe we could read that together. Let's, let's read that together. Ready? Go. If we start with transparency that leads to confession, it can result in transformation that can change the perception. It could happen. God could do something in us, not overnight, but little by little, day by day. And we could take that old perception that was this, if you remember. The old one was Christians say one thing but live something entirely different. But what if, what if, what if a new perception emerged? Christians are transparent about their flaws and act first and talk second. Something might change. And I believe the, the, the remedy for hypocrisy is being real, being real. And unless you're a, a parent with kids, you've probably never heard of the, this book. It's called The Velveteen Rabbit. And it's about little stuffed animals that were in, in a home and a conversation emerged between the rabbit and the skin horse one day, and it went like this. What is real? Asked the rabbit one day. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you in a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you're made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. It doesn't happen all at once. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to those who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. I think that's it. There, there's something in there in that child's book. But there will always be people who don't want to go there. But I know so many of you do. And if we let our Heavenly Father love us enough, and if we love each other enough that our hair starts to fall out and our eyes get ready to fall out and, our, and we just look a little bit shabby, then we might be onto something. We might be onto something. Because I can tell you um, a life of hiddenness, a life of wearing the mask will only do one thing. It will rob you of the life of God, the joy of God, the life of the Spirit that you were created for, and it will further perpetuate the perception of hypocritical. May God give us the courage to take steps toward transparency for the purpose of our transformation, the transformation of others, and for the glory of God. May it be so. Let's pray together. Well, Lord Jesus, we are here for you because of you to be changed by you. We hear your woes, 
And we ask that every woe would fall where it needs to fall in each of our lives as individuals and as our life as a church so that we could go, oh, that's me. That's me. And that we can say, I'm sorry. We can say, I'm sorry to you first, God. Sorry that you have called us to this life. You've given us access to your power, but we chose lesser things, a lesser way. And we have blurred and blocked and prevented people outside of the faith from getting a view of you as you really are fully revealed. So we need your help. God, we need your help. We want to be different. We want to be better than we are. And so, Holy Spirit, work within us. Draw us. Invite us. Give us courage to make decisions that will lead us to be people that we're currently not. So that a world that is out there, husbands and wives, friends and neighbors, co-workers, who are in desperate need of hope, will see you through us for their good and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.